So this project was motivated by, uh, we were thinking about uh, ESG investing. So environmental social governance investing uh, recently, which has really kind of boomed in the last five to 10 years, in particular the last five years. So this slide shows a, uh, a plot of cumulative flows, cumulative and, and changes in flows uh, into ESG equity mutual funds over the last five years. And it's really taken off. It's up to around $400 billion in the last year in terms of cumulative flows. And this is just equity mutual funds. This is not even accounting for pension funds and institutions and, and other, other individuals who are doing ESG focused investing. And so this got us to thinking, what does this all kind of mean for welfare, right? There's a sense in which uh, certainly ESG investors have at least in a loose sense welfare in mind when they're doing this, the notion they're doing something good, they're affecting the climate or governance or, or, or some such. But we wanted to think a little bit more carefully about this. You know, what does it mean for welfare that investors have shifted, in large part, so much, so, so, so much of their funds into these ESG-focused strategies and ESG-focused funds? So uh, this may affect welfare because we think investor decision making, we think asset prices affect firm investment decisions. There are real effects. So, you know, Leanne, who's in the audience, has done a lot of work on this. There are real effects of financial markets. So you can think of a firm considering investing in a new technology. The very relevant example in the last week or so is Ford, uh, who is transitioning at least in part to electric vehicles, including their, their leading F-150 line. And so if you're a firm investor, if you have a firm who's considering investing in a new technology, and ESG investors have private information about the efficiency or the efficacy of that technology, that information is going to be in part aggregated by prices. So this shift into ESG investing is going to affect asset prices, potentially change real investment decision-making by firms. So there's feedback from prices into real investment decision-making. That's going to affect long-term firm value, certainly going to affect welfare. There's a second effect, though, which is not, uh, which is kind of, kind of uh, uh, I think, missed in some of the discussion, which is that firm investment decision-making in this new technology, investment in green vehicles, is uh, potentially going to affect risk sharing due to its correlation with some kind of, in our model, some kind of economy-wide externality or exposure that investors have and they want to hedge. In the ESG, in the climate example, in the electric cars example, I think we can all think of a lot of potential externalities that are going to be correlated with electric car adoption that investors might care about. I mean, hedging exposure to climate risks, carbon emissions, sea level rises, global temperatures, what have you. And if the firm's investment decision affects the hedging properties of the asset or of assets that are out there, this is also going to affect investor welfare. So in other words, there are multiple roles of financial markets, especially in the presence of feedback. They're all interrelated. So we have to think about them in equilibrium and they can be in conflict. So all of these information aggregation, capital allocation, risk sharing roles. And at a high level, uh, one of our big points is gonna be that these are not necessarily capturing, though certainly not capturing the same thing, they don't necessarily move in the same direction. So individually, each of these potential measures, investment efficiency, information aggregation, risk sharing, are not welfare. Um, and so the all-in welfare consequence of ESG investing, of investment, say, in green technology, is unclear, at least without thinking a little bit more carefully about it. Why is welfare important? Well, we think welfare, I think, is important kind of per se, uh, but it's also important for informing policy decisions. So if welfare and investment decision making, investment efficiency are in conflict, then policy focuses, uh, policy evaluation based on measures of, say, investment efficiency may be misguided. Feedback itself, managerial learning from prices, could be welfare reducing. If, for instance, it harms risk sharing in a way that hurts investors on net. And we'll talk a little bit about, we won't have uh, as much to say in this particular paper about it, uh, but maximizing firm value may not in fact be the right objective. Maximizing firm value uh, certainly makes firm value higher, but it's not necessarily the same thing as making welfare higher. Okay. So that's kind of the, the overarching big picture goal and motivation. We're thinking we're motivated by ESG investing, investment in electric cars, say by Ford green technology. We're thinking about teasing out the welfare effects, the overall wel welfare effects in a situation where ESG investing inflows into ESG funds, 
affect real decisions by firms. So what do we do specifically with that as our goal? We're going to develop a stylized feedback effects model, which uh, I know a number of you in the audience are already familiar with. These are models where asset prices guide firm investment real decisions. Um, our model in many ways is going to be somewhat standard, which uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about it. We see to some extent the standard elements of the model are in part a contribution. Um, so we're gonna have car normal traders uh, who have uh, kind of, Mechanic, they, they look like endowment shocks. We're going to interpret these as exposures to an externality that you'd like to hedge or get rid of if you can. And of course, there's a real investment decision. The important features of this model are three or fourfold. One is, as I mentioned, many of our, our assumptions are kind of quote unquote standard. So it gives us a clean benchmark and a point of comparison uh, uh, to the rest of the feedback literature. Big picture, the, the, the big feature of the model is that we have very clean, well-defined measure of welfare. So we have symmetric investors with everybody having a well-defined utility function. And this is, this is important. So uh, a lot of feedback papers have noise traders or other traders who kind of are unmodeled. And so being able to think about welfare requires everybody to have a utility function. So we're gonna be able to account to, 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 to incorporate that. Um, if we have information aggregation by prices, we need some kind of noise to keep the model interesting. We're going to do that by exposures to the non-tradable externality. So we don't have noise traders. And there are risk sharing motives for trade. Traders all have potentially different exposures to this externality. Then there's gains to be had. Even totally ignoring the investment decision, there's risk sharing gains from trade to be had. And then it's feedback model. There's a manager who's gonna learn from prices, update, and take a real investment decision that affects the value of the firm. And of course, spills over and affects investors' welfare, both through the firm value and the risk sharing properties of the stock. So it's a feedback model. And certainly in the talk today, due to the limited time and also in the paper, we focus on a benchmark, uh, uh, a benchmark type of investment, which is simple project adoption for it either invests in electric call cars, or it does not, kind of a zero one decision. Um, we can generalize that um, as we'll see the basic, the basic message, the basic mechanisms are already present in the zero one setting. We're gonna characterize the financial market equilibrium and we're gonna think about welfare. Big picture result, high level result is as alluded to on previous slides, investment efficiency, in other words, notions of firm value or firm value maximization need not move one for one, need not capture welfare. In other words, need not capture investor expected utilities. They're related to them, but they need not move in the same way. So what drives this? Well, what, what, what elements of feedback drive this? Well, Feedback, first of all, always improves firm value, right? Almost, there's a sense in which it's almost mechanical. The manager's objective is to maximize firm value. And so learning new and additional information from prices can only make that, make her make that decision uh, kind of more efficiently. But the presence of risk sharing pushes in the opposite, can push in the opposite direction. So feedback can, and in fact does reduce welfare when the project, when the new technology has an ex ante positive NPV and the firm is small. So when investor exposures to the firm are small on average. Um, based on that, we're going to compare welfare maximizing investment with equilibrium investment. And we're gonna show that welfare maximizing investment invests more state by state than the manager does in equilibrium. The basic intuition behind all of this, the key driving force, is that the manager's investment decision affects the asset's exposure to shocks and therefore its usefulness as a hedge against this climate externality, okay? So when in any force that tends to make risk sharing loom relatively large in investors' objectives relative to simple firm value maximization is gonna put these forces in conflict. So for instance, feedback reduces welfare in part when the firm is small. Well, when the firm is small, it's a small part 
thinking kind of a bit outside the model. It's a small part of the market portfolio. Getting the firm value high has a relatively small effect relative to changing the set of hedging opportunities in the, in the economy. Okay, so it's this differential uh, uh, effect of the investment decision on risk sharing versus firm value that drives or can drive this wedge between investment efficiency and welfare. And so what does this tell us about, about policy, about, about, about the world? Well, in part, it tells us that feedback is not necessarily, managerial learning from prices is not necessarily always a good thing. So feedback should be encouraged for technologies that are ex ante unattractive, ex ante negative, in, you know, risky negative NPV projects. And especially when the firm is, uh, excuse me, when investors are well informed, and the firm has stable existing operations. In this situation, the firm value component of, of, of feedback looms especially large. On the other hand, feedback learning from prices can be small, can be harmful in smaller firms, startups say, or small cap firms, with ex ante attractive but risky projects. So one could imagine a firm like Ford living in the first bucket, right? Ford is a large firm with investor, with a broad, sophisticated investor base with arguably stable operations. We could argue a bit about whether uh, internal combustion engines is a stable existing operation, but Ford's a large, big picture, stable firm. Something like Tesla, especially early stage Tesla as of a few years ago, is a much smaller firm, <clears throat> the highly risky project. And what this says for policy is that investment efficiency, say measures of profitability, are not necessarily going to be good proxies for welfare when risk sharing is important. So just to put a little bit of, of flavor on this notion of, you know, when is feedback good, when is feedback bad? I think a natural question is, why would invest, why would managers or do managers ever ignore stock prices? Why would you ever want to ignore stock prices? Does this happen in practice? Well, there aren't, as far as we know, stu actual formal studies on this, but we can put a little bit of an a little bit of anecdotal evidence together. So I want to contrast two quotes, two sets of quotes uh, about Ford and Tesla from their CEOs. So uh, just this last week, Ford had uh, a capital markets day where they discussed all of their big new green uh, uh, projects, green innovations. Um, and so this was uh, pitched in this newspaper article as where investors and analysts hope CEO Farley details and uh, a vision for embracing an all electric future. And Ford CEO seems stoked about responding to shareholders, listening to shareholders, updating from their needs. So this is a very big day. It's my management team's coming out party. We're going to explain more about our electric, uh, electric, electrification plan. And we think this is going to add a ton of value to the company because of our transition. So it seems super excited, super responsive to shareholder, shareholder preferences, shareholder information. Contrast this with, with, this with Elon Musk. This is just one of, of course, many quotes, you, cranky quotes you can find from Musk. Uh, when he proposed taking Tesla private about three years ago, he said, we're subject to wild swings in our stock prices. It's a major distraction. Being public, having a stock, uh, you know, a, a public stock price puts enormous pressure on Tesla to make decisions that are just not necessarily right for the long term. So anecdotally, this suggests there can be very different responses to, uh, of management to, to shareholders, very different potential uh, uh, amounts of feedback, if you will, uh, across different types of firm, firms.